Um, purple. Purple has taken on kind of some highlight in the last 24 hours. Um, as we all remember, the unfortunate passing, the untimely passing, the shocking passing of Prince. And I think it is particularly difficult for people in Minnesota because he was one of our own. Um, purple is also important to the Minnesota Vikings. Purple pride its an important thing here. And those of you that are visiting our campus uh, know that we are awash in purple. And this color for us is really important because it symbolizes here at St. Thomas that this is our home and purple is the color that represents our endeavors and our sense of uh, community that's here. Today we get to express our own purple pride at having Dr. Kara Finnegan as our keynote speaker, the uh, Conrad Humanities Scholar at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. As Dina said, this is our 25th anniversary. I sometimes feel like I've been here so long that uh, Professor, or, uh, Archbishop Ireland and I started this place. <laughs> but in those days, we used to call this the UGRC. It took us 20 years to figure out that the acronym was wrong. We must have thought it was the Undergraduate Research Conference. And we finally changed it to the UCRC just a couple of years ago. So, but it's been, it's been going on for a long time, and we're just so pleased that we've been able to provide students with the opportunity to not only have their work recognized, but also to come together in this conference, in this opportunity to share uh, time and ideas with each other, and to do that in the spirit of the study of communication. But as I start my introduction, I want to uh, first of all say, this is really all about me. That I like to think of myself, at least now, as a bit of a futurist. I went back and looked at a letter of recommendation that I wrote for one of our seniors who was applying for graduate school in January of 1993. And I wrote this letter, I wrote these lines. In each of the capacities in which I have observed Kara, I found her to be unusually bright and articulate, a leader with support and loyalty from her peers, and a person who has an easy calm about her, but commands respect at the same time. I expect her to be very successful as a graduate student and a long-term contributing member of the teaching profession and the academy. In the classroom, Kara ranks among the 10 best students I have had since I began teaching at that point 18 years ago. I'm so old. Um, I go on to say that Kara is pleasant and enjoyable to be with, but she is no pushover. I think it is this combination of warm personality and confidence in her abilities which makes Kara a model student and a good candidate for a career in, a, in academia. I fully expect that Kara will make it. I am glad to say that I was right. Kara did leave here uh, the following year and went on to the University of Maine where she completed her master's degree. And then she received a, a PhD from Northwestern University in 1999. It was after that that she was hired at the University of Illinois. And as we now know, she went on to become uh, an internationally recognized scholar and teacher. Uh, some of the courses that she has taught, I just cherry-picked a few that looked um, appropriate for our conference. She has taught courses in concepts and visual rhetoric, visual politics of U.S. public culture, photography and public life, visual politics, rhetorical criticism, and even a course in art history. Um, all I can say is I look at those titles and I look at Karen, I want to take all of your classes. So perhaps in retirement I'll be in your, in your classroom. Uh, I reviewed her CV, her curriculum vitae, and her scholarship alone extends to over, over eight pages of books, articles, reviews, presentations, and invited lectures. She has published in such journals as Rhetoric and Public Affairs, Rhetoric Society Quarterly, Presidential Studies Quarterly, Argumentation and Advocacy, and one of the top journals in our field, the Quarterly Journal of Speech. Among her several books is her most recent one, Making Photography Matter, a viewer's history from the Civil War to the Great Depression. She has already won uh, awards and recognition for this book, and her reputation 
And this work is going on to become a significant contribution to our understanding of visual communication. Now, in a rubric that only we geeky academics even recognize, there is a number of citations that a person's work gets in other people's uh, academic writing. And I looked at Google Scholar listing to see uh, about Dr. Finnegan and the esteem with which she, her work is held among her colleagues. She has been cited over 650 times by her colleagues in their writing about the work that coincides with hers. That is a, a remarkable and impressive number. She has also won a number of uh, awards, uh, several from the National Communication Association. She has won the Golden Monograph Award, the Excellence in Visual Communication Research Award, and the Diamond Anniversary Book Award. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, as I think back on those days when Kara was a student here, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were the most excellent babysitter we ever had. <laughs> that is important. And so I'm really proud. I, I feel like a little bit of an academic father here, being able to, to say with great pride that I introduce to you Dr. Kara Finnegan, where she will give us a talk on American presidents and the history of photography from the derogatype to the digital revolution. Let us welcome Dr. Kara Finnegan. Wow, that was proof that professors keep your stuff forever. So everybody look out. Thank you, Kevin, for that introduction, a uh, very moving introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be back uh, at St. Thomas. I grew up in St. Paul, and I'm back often to see family, but this is the first time since I graduated I've had the chance to come back in any kind of formal capacity, and it's just really wonderful to be here. And, and um, uh, I, I want to, uh, before I go on further, I want to thank uh, Dr. Dina Gavrilos and also Ayuna for doing such a great job uh, keeping me on track and organizing me for my presentation for all of you today. So um, thanks to both of you. Um, it's not only fun to be at this conference because I'm back at St. Thomas, it's also fun because I presented at this conference. Um, I think we just figured out it was the second one so I actually graduated in 1992, and then I took kind of a gap year before I went on uh, to graduate school. And uh, so I guess it would have been in the spring of 93, uh, Kevin Sauter said, hey, we have this conference. You know, hey, you're going to grad school. Why don't you come and do this? So uh, like perhaps many of you today, this was your first conference presentation. And this conference was also my first conference presentation. Um, and what I talked about at that conference was, uh, it was actually a piece from Dr. Sauter's media criticism class about uh, a little TV show called Northern Exposure, which if only it were available on Netflix, you would all be binging it all the time because it was a really wonderful show. But apparently, in an interesting institutional kind of factoid, because the popular music on the show is so common uh, or so popular and good, um, they can't get the rights to all the songs. It would cost too much money, I guess, to put the show on Netflix. So if it ever gets on there, remember I told you it's a really good show and you should all find it and watch it. Um, I thought that um, uh, before I get into my conversation today about presidents and photography, uh, that I might mark this um, historic moment of my triumphant return to the campus of the University of St. Thomas uh, with a photo of me with my parents. Uh, you saw my mom, Norma Finnegan, and my dad, uh, John Finnegan Sr., uh, uh, on the quad at graduation in 1992. Um, don't, look so, don't look too closely, but if you look too closely at me, you'll see there's many more wrinkles on my forehead. Um, it's also really great to have some family here today because it's not often that you get to do your job in front of your mother, so we'll see how I do. The election of Barack Obama opened a new chapter in the history of the US presidency and transformed the visual practices of the office. Just a few months after the 2009 inauguration, the Obama administration announced that it would use the popular social media site Flickr to uh, share White House photographs with the public. Now, previous administrations had employed White House photographers to chronicle each president's time in office, but really with an eye toward posterity. It would be something that you could eventually find in the president's uh, library or archive or museum. Uh, but Obama did something different. He expanded presidential photography into an unprecedented real-time social media strategy. 
Well into Obama's second term, the White House Flickr photo stream today contains uh, more than 6,000 photographs, offering viewers a carefully curated behind the scenes look at the President of the United States. By communicating his visual image to the public in ways that bypass traditional media almost entirely, uh, I wanna suggest that Barack Obama has changed um, not only the history of presidential image making, but he's actually been a really key player in a big transformation in the history of photography itself, and that is the digital revolution. While some scholars have studied how a few presidents have used photography to gain authority or to get elected, um, no one yet has asked what presidents' relationships with photography can tell us about the history of this very important medium. And this lack of attention is surprising because Obama is certainly not the first president to shape photography in the public sphere. Throughout US history, presidents have participated in uh, photography as subjects, producers, and consumers of photographs. The new book that I'm working on explores how presidents have helped to shape Americans' experiences of photography across its 175-year history. Using evidence gathered from archival research and analysis of published texts and images, a lot of the same kinds of texts and images that many of you are talking about at this conference today, uh, I'm focusing specifically on how presidents engaged with photography at moments of technological transformation. And today I'm gonna to talk about two of those moments. Uh, the first will be the introduction of photography via the daguerreotype portrait after 1839. Um, this is, uh, an image of uh, former President John Quincy Adams made in 1843. I'll talk a little bit more about Adams later, but I got to hold it in my hand, which if you are a history geek, is just about the coolest thing that you could ever possibly experience. And of course I shared it with everyone on Facebook immediately because I am also very modern and technologically savvy. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about the daguerreotype and then um, uh, I wanna talk, part of the reason why I wanna do some historical work here is I think we forget that every era actually has its own new media. So television used to be a new medium, the telegraph in the mid 19th century was a new medium, and photography was a transformative new medium. And so uh, by kind of bookending the talk today with, uh, with um, the earliest photographs and then some of the latest things uh, that presidents are doing with photography, I'm hoping to kind of make an argument about that to essentially convince you that while we have new media now, we've always had new media. It just depends on who it's new to, right? <laughs> photography first emerged as a public art with the introduction of the daguerreotype in France in 1839. I will miss that smile, I have to say. The daguerreotype uh, was a one-of-a-kind photograph made with a chemically sensitized copper plate. And while the earliest daguerreotypes were made outdoors, um, when the daguerreotype came across the Atlantic to the United States, it turned out that Americans got really, really good at making portraits. And so the American daguerreotype uh, really took off with the idea of the portrait. Robert Cornelius made the first daguerreotype portrait in the United States in 1839. Um, interestingly, this is a self-portrait, so what does that make this photo? It's a selfie. It's the first portrait made in the United States was actually a selfie, so that's a factoid to take to all your friends at parties. The new medium of the daguerreotype was revolutionary for two reasons. Um, first, because it allowed you to faithfully reproduce the likeness of someone with more accuracy than a painted portrait, which would have been all you had before. And in addition, because portraits of all kinds were understood to communicate something about the character of the person pictured. So daguerreotypes then would seem to offer even more um, accurate, and I put that in quotes, visual evidence about the, about the character of someone uh, to the viewer. Portraits made and exhibited, uh, or rather photographers made and exhibited photographs of the nation's leaders very early on, partly because they thought, if I can photograph important people, then people will think photography is important. And so that's what they tried to do. The first daguerreotype studio opened in Washington, D.C. in January of 1841. It was set up in a hotel room, and its proprietors were two men named Justice Moore and some guy known only to history as Captain Wood. 
or Captain Ward, sorry. Um, and they reportedly used their connections to the vice president and to members of Congress to bring in the business of curious politicians. Hey, we have this new thing. We would like to try it out on you. Uh, and usually they would do this for free under the assumption that then they would kind of get some publicity or business. The first sitting president to be photographed was William Henry Harrison in 1841, just after his inauguration. And the news, uh, news reports in the papers suggested that Harrison was, quote, delighted with the results. That daguerreotype itself has been lost to history, although it probably outlived its subject, because as many of you likely remember, William Henry Harrison famously died after serving only one month in office. The first earliest photographs of a sitting president that we still have today are those of James K. Polk, who was photographed numerous times while in office in the late 1840s. And if we wanted to, we could chronicle all of these photographic firsts uh, all the way up to the present day. So for example, Barack Obama is the first president whose official photograph was made with a digital camera. And last year, Obama became the first president to sit for a 3D digital portrait in which his head and torso were scanned to create a digital life mask of the president. This digital life mask was then turned into a 3D sculptor, sculpture using a 3D printer. So we have come pretty far. Now what interests me most about these and other presidential photographs isn't so much this idea of the firsts. Um, it's really more how the very existence of images like this tells us a story about the history of photography in the United States. The first part of that story involves the role that the daguerreotype played in preserving the public memory of the American Revolution and the early republic. And so that's the first thing I'm gonna talk about today because almost immediately uh, upon its appearance in the United States, the daguerreotype became a way for people of that time to connect their present to their pretty recent past, the founding of the nation. Now, if you know anything about the history of Washington, you know that there couldn't possibly be photographs of George Washington because he died 40 years before photography was invented. Yet we have photographs of George Washington, so how is this? He emerged as a subject of early photography almost as soon as the instructions for making daguerreotypes made their way on a ship across the Atlantic in 1839. He was obviously not available to be photographed from life, but his image nevertheless circulated in daguerreotypes of busts of him and of painted portraits of him. So ironically, photographs of George Washington are some of the earliest presidential images that we have. So here are a couple of examples. Um, Gilbert Stewart's uh, famously unfinished Athenaeum portrait of George Washington was copied by daguerreotypist John Adams Whipple in 1847. And similarly, uh, the same portrait uh, with the uh, face flipped, right, so it's just kind of the reverse image, um, was uh, photographed by the Boston Gallery Southworth and Hawes in the early 1850s. Now, I don't think the choice to photograph portraits of George Washington was random. Uh, for nearly all of the 19th century, George Washington was the visual icon of uh, the nation. He was its metaphorical father figure and shaper of its national character. Um, and uh, the scholar Barry Schwartz tells us that between 1800 and 1860, American writers produced at least 400 books, essays, and articles on Washington's life. During this time, he says, Washington's image was not that of a mere celebrity, it was sacred. The 1820s and 30s brought the rise of the illustrated celebrity biography, yes, they had those then, um, followed around 1840 by illustrated history books uh, that wanted to uh, communicate something about the founding of the nation. And so uh, this example here is John Frost's 1844 hist uh, pictorial history of the United States. Uh, and that book affirmed for readers Washington's national paternity with reproductions of, again, that same famous Gilbert Stuart portrait, uh, this time in an engraving. Notice how he's uh, surrounded by lots of other images of the nation. Lady Liberty, actually two ladies Liberty, kind of lounging at the top there. Uh, the American Eagle, the flag, and at the bottom, the Constitution. So uh, he's a pretty big symbol. But it wasn't just his status as a national icon that fostered the impulse to photograph him. Throughout the 18th and into the 19th century, portraits were believed to communicate information about someone's moral character. Popular ideas of the time suggested that one's appearance, especially one's facial appearance, 
might be evidence of one's morality. We actually see this in, often in a very negative sense today in, um, uh, in the early 20th century in uh, arguments about uh, eugenics and then also a lot of arguments today about racial profiling are very much tied to the same set of beliefs uh, uh, that connect the way somebody looked supposedly to their moral character. So we'd like to say we don't believe these things anymore, but I think some kind of vestiges of this discourse still unfortunately remains. If portraits had the capacity to communicate character, then it would make sense that the person who supposedly had the greatest moral character in the history of the United States, that we would want photographic portraits of him. So that's part of what I think is going on. Why would you photograph a painting? Well, because it's George Washington, right? Most interesting to me of the early photographs um, featuring Washington are daguerreotypes that juxtapose portraits or busts of him with real life people. Um, typically women and children. And these images tapped into conventions of theater to tell allegorical patriotic stories of good citizens properly worshiping the father of their national family. This daguerreotype uh, made in the early 1850s features a young woman gazing at a portrait of George Washington. And in doing so, she seems to kind of invite us to gaze along with her and perhaps also reflect upon the greatness and the moral character of the man himself. A similar daguerreotype dating from the mid-1840s uh, uh, pictures what looks to be a mother and a daughter, and the daughter is gazing down upon a print of George Washington resting in the mother's lap. Photographer Gabriel Harrison earned public acclaim in 1845 for this allegorical portrait of his son, whom he had named George Washington Harrison. And Harrison made a similar daguerreotype of his daughter with a different bust of Washington 10 years later. And I like to imagine that he just has a studio with like these random busts of Washington hanging out and he just like, you know, picks one and then gets his kids to come on up and pose. And so these images are really interesting because again, they tie to that notion of Washington is the father of the national family. Um, and then the children become kind of loving citizens, right? They're literally wrapping their arms around the nation in, in a kind of allegorical way. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that the impulse to photograph Washington appeared at really the same moment when the generation of the revolution and the early founding was dying out. Um, Washington, Adams, and Jefferson were long gone, but President uh, James Madison's widow, Dolly Madison, lived long enough to be photographed, as did John Quincy Adams. And John Quincy Adams was the son of second president, John Adams, and also uh, himself a former president. So like the photographs of Washington, images of Dolly Madison and John Quincy Adams, I'll show you some of those in a moment, um, they provided citizens with a memory of the nation's founding. But unlike these images of Washington, because they were photographed from life, they really provided this kind of like material bodily link to the earliest years of the nation. Now, perhaps no one in the 1840s served as that literal embodiment of the revolution and early republic more than Dolly Madison. The former first lady had for decades been honored as a national hero, mainly because of a widely circulated story from the War of 1812 when she was first lady. The British were descending upon Washington, D.C., and they were headed for the White House. They were burning everything. And the story goes that Dolly Madison rescued Gilbert Stewart's 1796 portrait of George Washington and um, took it with her before the British came and burned down the White House. Stories of this moment of patriotism, Dolly Madison saving literally the image of the nation's founding father, um, circulated regularly over the years, interestingly often by Dolly Madison herself. She seems to have been very keen about the publicity. And they marked her as a kind of patriotic savior of the Union. Now, the story itself um, is apocryphal. This is an artistic rendering of, of one version of the story. The story itself is apocryphal, and most scholars who've really deeply researched this and, and, and looked at the archival material now believe that, at most, she might have directed slaves to take down the portrait. Think about that for a moment. But it's actually possible that she didn't really have much to do with this choice at all. Nevertheless, she was a really important figure and link to this period in American history later in her life. By the mid-1840s, Dolly Madison had been widowed nearly 20 years and she had returned to live in Washington, D.C. 
Her biographer, Catherine Algor, calls this period Madison's iconic phase, writing, quote, if she was a significant presence in the Capitol before, she now became a personage for the ages. And indeed, it seems like Dolly Madison functioned as a kind of queen mother or first citizen uh, in the nation's capital. Among many other honors, she had her own seat in the gallery of the House of Representatives, um, and she was the first private citizen to send a telegraph message. There's that new media again. She regularly visited the White House and was called upon at home by presidents and other national and international luminaries. She personally knew 14 presidents in her lifetime, beginning with Washington, straight through to Zachary Taylor, and also James Buchanan, and a young congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. Now think about that for a moment. How many presidents have we had? 44? So she knew 14 of the 44 presidents we've had in our nation's history. It's pretty interesting. Lincoln would have met Dolly Madison because both were involved in fundraising efforts for the Washington Monument. And uh, Dolly Madison, in fact, on July 4th, 1848, where uh, the day that this print here represents, she was on hand as a very important invited guest in a dramatic public ceremony to commemorate the laying of the cornerstone for uh, the Washington Monument. In 1848, Matthew Brady made daguerreotypes of Madison posing alone and with her niece, Anna Payne. Some secondary sources claim that these daguerreotypes were actually made on the same day as the laying of the cornerstone of the Washington Monument. Um, I haven't been able to determine that yet, but if it's true, it would be a really great story, wouldn't it? Because it would link Dolly Madison even more closely to uh, this kind of important uh, connection to the founding of the nation. So I'm still looking for sources. To make a, a daguerreotype of Dolly Madison, really at any time, but especially at this moment when the nation was commemorating George Washington, would really be this very bodily link to the revolutionary period in our country. And the significance would not have been lost on the photographer Matthew Brady because uh, one of his goals was to create a public gallery that contained what he called lifelike portraits of every distinguished American now living. And the photographs themselves um, suggest both continuity and change. Brady's daguerreotypes picture Madison as a kind of calm, benevolent uh, citizen lady. And remarkably, in a period where very few people actually smiled for photographs, uh, Dolly Madison's facial expression in these images is pretty modern with its open smile. Um, and I would suspect that maybe her years in the public eye had perhaps um, taught her how to hold still for long periods of time with certain expressions on her face, which the daguerreotype required you to do to get a good quality picture. So she might have had many years in receiving lines and other public events where she learned how to put on a face, as it were, and that became handy when photography appeared. But if the face seems modern, her dress is not modern at all. And she wears a very now, uh, in 1848, very out of fashion turban on her head. Um, and, but this was kind of her signature look from her earlier era of national prominence. So she was clearly not gonna give up that public look. That's how people thought of her and remembered her. But again, I think this image is really interesting because you've got this, um, this uh, older woman wearing dated clothing, and then a younger woman who's clearly dressed looking a little bit more like a mid-19th century person. The sense of continuity with the past is perhaps best illustrated in an unusual group daguerreotype, likely made two years earlier in the summer of 1846 at the White House. Dolly Madison routinely visited President Polk and his wife Sarah at home, and Polk's own diary very frequently records her coming to the White House for lunch or for dinner or for reception. She was always a very honored guest. This daguerreotype was likely made by the painter George P.A. Healy, who was at the time staying at the White House to paint a portrait of the president. Um, uh, and in fact, he painted many portraits. If you ever visit the White House, you'll see a lot of his portraits of presidents on the walls. And this, this daguerreotype records what really must have been kind of a, a, a really fortuitous photo opportunity because it condenses in one image really the nation's, not only the nation's past and present, but also its future. So let's read this image briefly. The past is represented by Dolly Madison. Again, you can see she's um, a little fuzzy in the back row there, but she's got her signature outfit on. Um, its present is represented by President Polk and his wife in the middle of the frame. And then its future is actually represented by 
Secretary of State James Buchanan at left, who would become president less than 12 years later. Another relic of the revolution was John Quincy Adams. He was the son of former president, himself a former president, and in the 1840s, he was a sitting congressman from Massachusetts. Photographers were also eager to preserve Adams photographically at the end of his life, but what I'm really interested in about Adams is Adams himself was really interested in photography. And we know this because he wrote in his diary about his experiences being photographed. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that and show you some images of him. What I think is really interesting about these accounts of Adams is that they give us insight into how um, people exposed to this new medium tried to make sense of it this new strange thing. Adams was in his mid-70s when he was photographed twice in 1843. And these photographs actually constitute the oldest photographs that we have of a living president. Uh, he was not president when they were made, but they are the oldest photographs we have of a president. On March 8, 1843, Adams chronicled in his diary what was likely his first experience being photographed. And this is the image that resulted, which is fabulous. I love it. That morning, um, uh, he visited Philip Haas's studio in Washington, D.C., and Haas was a daguerreotypist and a lithographer, which basically meant that he made engravings. Um, and in an era before you could print photographs in books or magazines or newspapers, um, artists would make engravings of photographs, which could then be reproduced in some other print form. And if these engravings were especially artful, you could also sell them just as images that someone might you know, hang in their home. In fact, Haas later made a lithograph of this daguerreotype he made of Adams, and in doing so, apparently he was the first person to ever do this, to make a daguerreotype into a lithograph. Um, if you compare these two images, you notice they're not, they're not exactly identical, and I won't say a whole lot about this, but I just want to point out that um, reproducing a photograph didn't necessarily mean making it look exactly like the photograph. People took artistic license. So here you see there's like a handkerchief on his lap in the photograph, but it becomes a book in the lithograph. Um, they've changed a little bit of the aspect of his face. He doesn't seem quite so severe in the lithograph. He seems more thoughtful and less, I think, accusatory <laughs> as he is in the photo, right? And of his visit to uh, the daguerreotypist, this is what Adams wrote. March 8th, I walked this morning to Mr. Haas's shop, and he took from his camera three daguerreotype likenesses of me. The operation is performed in half a minute, but is altogether incomprehensible to me. Mr. Haas says it is a chemical process upon mercury, silver, gold, and iodine. It would seem as easy to stamp a fixed portrait from the reflections of a mirror. But how wonderful would that reflection itself be if we were not familiarized to it from childhood? I'm going to come back to parts of this uh, quotation uh, uh, in a minute. This description of sitting for a daguerreotype likeness, note that no one's using the word photography. Um, uh, it's really interesting for a couple of reasons. And the first is that Adams negotiates his experience of this new medium by translating it through something he knows. And for him, that's this thing called the camera obscura. So he does something we all do when we encounter something unfamiliar. We try to translate it through the lens of the familiar. So Adams' reference to the camera obscura um, um, is kind of an attempt to do this, although it's not exactly correct. The camera obscura was a precursor to technologies of photography, um, and it means, in Latin, it means dark room. Uh, and the, the camera obscura really gained popularity during the Renaissance period and the scientific revolution as a way to produce accurate rending, renderings of objects. And so it was essentially an optical device into which light would pass in such a way uh, as to display an image of an object, which you could then trace the outlines of it to make a pretty accurate picture. So at first glance, Haas's daguerreotype camera, and this is an example of a very early camera, might have looked actually a lot like a camera obscura in terms of the lens, the box, et cetera. Um, but its purpose, of and its purpose of accurate rendering was also similar, but of course, Adams would have understood or would have been made to understand that while the camera obscura could never fix an image, it could just reflect an image that you would then work with, the daguerreotype itself would capture an image and then preserve it on the plate of the daguerreotype. In fact, what I think is really interesting about the remarks in his diary is, um, is that um, Adam seems to understand uh, and ask a lot of questions so that he can understand better. He understands this is a strange new thing, but he wants to know. So probably 
he can tell us in his diary that it's a chemical process upon mercury, silver, et cetera, because he chit-chatted with this person and kind of tried to figure out what that was. So it's clear that he was curious um, about it. And he must have asked some questions. However, they are ultimately unsuccessful because the operation is altogether yet incomprehensible to me. So whatever he learned, it was all still kind of magical and mysterious and interesting. He doesn't quite get it yet. But I like that word yet because it suggests that maybe he'll figure it out once he gets more comfortable with this new medium. So the diary count gives us a really interesting understanding of how people encountered this new medium of photography. Um, but I also want to turn our attention to the end of this entry here and talk a little bit about that. Here's what he says. It would seem as easy to stamp a fixed portrait from the reflections of a mirror, but how wonderful would that reflection itself be if we were not familiarized to it from childhood? I spend a lot of time thinking about this sentence because it's kind of funky. And if you do textual criticism long enough and stare at things, you, know, you really have to kind of puzzle out what might he really have meant by this? Or how I m might I understand what I think is going on here? Notice that he says the experience of a daguerreotype is like viewing uh, oneself in a mirror. Again, he's making an analogy. But then he says, if we were not familiarized to it from childhood, again, produce, used to seeing our own reflection in a mirror, right, every time we look at ourselves, how wonderful would that reflection itself be? So for Adams, it seems, what's really interesting to him about the daguerreotype um, and what makes it potentially wonderful is its capacity to reveal the reflections of others to us, maybe even strangers. So I might be really used to looking at my face, but if someone wasn't really used to looking at my face, wouldn't it be really interesting if they could look at my face? Um, or if I could look at other people's faces? So in my view, I think what Adams is offering us uh, is a kind of really interesting, almost a theory of photographic viewing. This idea that what photography does and what it's gonna continue to do is to provide citizens with new ways of seeing themselves and others. Um, and so for Adams, it seems that photography might not be so much or, or only about reproducing an accurate likeness or maybe even depicting someone's character, but really communicating. But alas, that communication sometimes lets you down. In August of 1843, Adams again sat for a daguerreotype while on a trip to Utica, New York with his nephew. In his diary, Adams pronounced the resulting likenesses all hideous, and he concluded they are too true to the original. <laughs> so every time you've deleted a selfie and then taken another better one, right? we all know this feeling. Um, and so this certainly points maybe to the downside of photography's capacity for communication. Um, it might also so accurately render our likeness um, in a way that might bring more pain than pleasure. As a technology for, capturing uh, for the capturing of memory and for communication then, the daguerreotype heralded new modes of picturing that would be transformed time and time again by a variety of changing photographic technologies. And so if you were reading my book, which has not been written yet, this would be the part where you would read about a lot of other stuff. But what I'm gonna do is take the speaker's license to skip about 150 years ahead and talk a little bit now about the changes from here to here. Presidents and presidential images would, in a variety of ways, continue to teach Americans something about ourselves. And I'm gonna make an argument at the end of this that Obama is actually teaching us about ourselves here, not so much about him. So let's talk a little bit about the digital revolution in photography, uh, something probably closer to most of us in room in terms of time. Um, generally speaking, we can date the digital revolution of photography to three events. The development of digital cameras, which began, um, believe it or not, in the early 1970s, and emerged commercially after 1988. The development of the image processing software Photoshop, which was first marketed in 1989. And then finally, the rise of mobile or cell phone photography in the late 1990s. And that was fueled especially by the introduction of mobile applications or apps in the late 2000s. And just to give you some kind of recent history, the Apple App Store, that's very hard to say by the way, the Apple App Store uh, first opened in 2008. So we're talking about very recent history here. But it seems like so long ago at the same time. Feels like we've always had the App Store. This infographic nicely illustrates these changes, um, especially the shift from analog to digital photography since 1990. 
Um, today, probably every single person in this room has at least one camera on their person right now. Sometimes when I teach and talk about this, we have a contest to see who, who has the most cameras on them. Uh, and it's sometimes three to four, sometimes five, if people have a lot of devices in their bags. Um, we also have the capability of taking and sharing an image with those cameras in our bags um, instantly through apps. In 2012, Fortune Magazine reported that 10% of all photos ever taken, ever, were taken in 2011. Instagram has uh, 75 million users per day, depending on whose numbers you use, and Facebook users upload between 250 and 300 million photographs um, per day. And as this infographic tells us on the bottom there, today we snap as many photos every two minutes as humanity as a whole did in the 1800s. So this is the digital revolution. And here's how photo apps describe themselves. Instagram invites you to capture and share the world's moments. Facebook invites you to connect with friends and the world around you. Snapchat is for real-time picture chatting. Sharing, capturing, connecting, chatting, these terms um, point to a transformation in our relationship to photography. And in 2012, writer and curator Pete Brook argued in Wired Magazine, quote, photographs are no longer things, they are experiences. With social media, it's clear that we really now are, I think, living in an age that John Quincy Adams could only have vaguely predicted, that age of photography as connection. I opened my talk by pointing out that uh, how the Obama administration in 2009 began using social media photography via Flickr to share official White House photos. Now, Flickr embraces the ethos of everyday photography. Anyone can create an account, upload, tag, or share photos. The White House debuted the Flickr photo stream in 2009, just a few months after the inauguration. And in choosing to use Flickr, the White House made photos it produces on a regular basis publicly accessible in a living archive that has been growing over time. The genius of the White House Flickr photo site is that it builds a living, changing historical record of the presidency using the deceptively transparent ethos of social media. One thing I think this does with Obama is it normalizes a view of the presidency as accessible in a behind the scenes way and presents us with a president who seems to be just like us. He hugs his wife. He plays with children. <laughs> this is a, just a quick aside. I was uh, visiting with a friend the other day and I was sort of, he said, what's your talking to me about? And I said, oh, I'm talking about Obama and social media. He goes, oh, I love that picture of Obama with the kid dressed as Spider-Man. Like he pulled it right up. I was like, you should go give my talk. <laughs> he plays with his dog. The photos uh, posted to Flickr are, post are selected by editors in the White House photo office who choose images to share with the public from the upwards of five to 20,000 images made by the White House per week. That's a lot of photos. Most of them are like, I meet the president, I shake his hand, right, we get a photo, that kind of thing. But that's thousands of photos. And incidentally, the, uh, the Presidential Records Act um, uh, in Congress dictates that nothing can be deleted. Every single image made has to be saved because it belongs to you and me. Uh, it's a part of the government record. So what we get on Flickr then is by no means filtered uh, or, um, uh, or, trans or unfiltered or transparent. It offers the public a view of the president and the institution of the presidency, definitely that the administration wants us to see, right? They're not putting anything on Flickr that they're um, not uh, aware that they're putting on Flickr. But it isn't only sweet humanizing photos of the president with his dogs. Um, one thing I've argued in some of my earlier research is that one theme of the earliest White House Flickr photos seemed to be that of authorizing Obama's presidency. Um, you may remember when Obama, during the 2008 campaign, which seems very long ago now, um, uh, there were arguments about whether Obama was even uh, a citizen, whether he could legally be president. There were all kinds of racist memes and other sorts of things uh, going around the web. And so one of the things I think that happened when he took office was that the White House made a really concerted effort to, to not only say, okay, he's president, but to associate him with the long history of uh, what many scholars in communication call the mythic presidency, this idea that the president is a very important particular kind of person, but also a symbol of the nation. So here's a really a clear example of the kind of thing that I mean. Um, and we also see this just in other incidental images of Obama at work, the uh, White House photographers taking advantage of the scenery, you might say. 
Um, and in other cases, uh, White House photos have uh, functioned almost as press releases, uh, as in this example of a very famous photo of Obama and other uh, officials watching the raid on bin Laden's compound unfold. Uh, this might be the single most viewed image on Flickr, actually. So the White House Flickr photo stream uses the conventions of social media, capturing, sharing, and curating um, to invite engagement and connection with the president and with the presidency. But Flickr functions not only as an instrument of the White House, uh, because these are available to all of us, they've become a kind of set of image resources that anybody can use. Um, sometimes we just recirculate them, as in this photo that became viral um, and famously known. Uh, this is a, a child who was just bored, you know, hanging around the president, so boring. Um, he, so he became online, uh, known online as Faceplant Kid. Um, at other times, the photo streams has served as a source for themed slideshows, listicles, and other clickbait that recirculate the photos out of context as part of the broader pop culture landscape. So two of the most recent ones were all the times the president lost his chill around kids, and this was Obama greeting a little baby who came to the White House Halloween party dressed as the Pope, and he had his own little Pope mobile. Um, and then uh, more recently, there was a Tumblr site uh, called President Obama with Babies, um, and they just post lots of pictures of President Obama with babies, which are very enjoyable and fun to look at. He likes babies, apparently. So beyond Flickr, in the last couple of years, the Obama administration has increasingly participated in the world of the app. In 2013, White House, Chief White House photographer Pete Souza joined Instagram, and he said that he was encouraged to do so by the White House Digital Strategy Office. So yes, they have a digital strategy. We should not be surprised by that. In an interview with Time Magazine, Souza observed that his Instagram work would be more for photos, um, kind of away from the primary action of photographing Obama, and he said he wanted to give viewers something, quote, more fun and personal than the photos we post to Flickr. Now, the president, him, so here's a glimpse of just uh, a shot of some of the images that are on the Instagram, uh, Pete Souza's Instagram site, which is a really interesting site to follow if you're interested in this kind of thing. Now, the president himself is participating in the photography of connection in a couple of ways. The first is that he's increasingly drawn in as a photographic subject via selfie culture. Um, uh, as I pointed out earlier, selfies are not new. Um, Obama participates in selfie culture both as a subject in photographs with regular citizens and with other elites. That's Bill Nye, the science guy, and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, my favorite astronomer. Um, and indeed, the president seems to serve as a kind of barometer for the unwritten rules of selfie culture, because we all know there are rules. It's cool when he poses for a selfie with Vice President Joe Biden. Um, it's his first selfie, so you want to celebrate that with your buddy. But it's more vexing when he does it in the uh, selfie scene around the world made at Nelson Mandela's funeral in South Africa. Um, that's him with the British Prime Minister and the Danish Prime Minister. Never one to miss an opportunity to connect with voters, the Obama White House has begun to mobilize this new photography of connection in the context of particular policy campaigns. And the first of these, I am now gonna show this again because I can't stop loving it, was a, was a BuzzFeed video released in 2015 where Obama used a selfie stick and parodied selfie culture in order to encourage young people to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. So this ad was directed at most of the people in this room. Most recently, with, uh, in August, with great fanfare, the president took over the White House um, Instagram feed on a trip to Alaska to promote climate change policy. And he announced his presence with the, with the cheery, hey everyone, it's Barack. The White House wrote this on its blog. Quote, President Obama is seeing the effects of climate change firsthand and is sharing it directly with Americans across the country. For the first time ever, the president is taking over the White House Instagram parentheses, and personally taking the photos, close parentheses, to give you a look inside the trip. Then moving from sharing and connection to policy action, the White House encouraged users of Instagram to quote, take a look at what the president has posted so far and double tap his photos if you agree we need to take action on climate change. Of course, on Instagram, the double tap is what you do, right, when you want to show you like a photo. So while we might wonder whether simply liking something is the same thing as taking action on it, um, nevertheless, what we see is this photography of connection being put to some kind of a policy use um, by the White House. On his own Instagram feed, Pete Souza photographed the president making photographs and jokingly turned him my competition. 
even though a few media outlets um, humorously compared, they took Pete Souza's photographs of the glacier and next to Obama's, and then they concluded, not surprisingly, that Pete Souza is a better photographer than the president. I would hope so, he's being paid to do that job. Um, in the photography of connection, the images themselves actually really didn't matter. What mattered much more was that the president was not only um, seeing firsthand the effects of climate change, but that he was, quote, sharing it directly with Americans. And I've highlighted this comment here as one commenter wrote on the White House Instagram feed during the Alaska trip, so cool to see what you see and to read your comments. So this then seems to be the transformation. While American citizens used to gaze into their president's eyes to discern something about character or remember the nation's founding, now we want to see through the president's eyes to experience connection. So ultimately then, photography doesn't only show us things to look at, it teaches us how to see. And today, digital photography, with its emphasis on the app and the shared image, offers uh, millions and millions of pictures to us. Um, so many pictures, in fact, that the picture may itself almost be beside the point. 21st century viewers navigate public life in part by sharing experiences visually um, with the app as a tool to foster connection. And we're clearly really only beginning to come to terms with the implications of this transformation, um, both in photography and in ourselves. And I think um, we're seeing actually lots of examples of people trying to come to terms with the implications of this digital revolution in this conference today. I think communication scholars are uniquely positioned to um, do this research. And if you're interested in continuing to do this research, um, the field of communication is a great place to continue to do that. What I want to suggest is I think that one way we can come to terms with what's happening on the right, which is really interesting, is to try to figure out how it connects to what's happening on the left. So what is it about our history that can inform the way that we understand how we're relating to photography now? And for me, the presidency, um, and hopefully you've, uh, I've convinced you today, that the presidency is a really interesting site for uh, addressing some of these questions. So thank you very much. I'm not sure we ha how we are on time, but I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone wants to make a question or offer a question or a comment. Or you can just keep eating your dessert too, that's okay. Yeah, so the question was, um, the Kennedy administration um, uh, did a lot with photography, and am I looking at that at all? Um, I will be a little bit, and um, uh, that is a site that actually people have done a lot of really good uh, writing about. There's a really great book by an art historian named David Leuven called, um, called kind of, uh, pointedly called Shooting Kennedy which is about his, it's called, uh, JF, the subtitle is JFK and the Culture of Images. And he does a really great job in that book talking about um, especially how the Kennedy family, um, even before JFK ran, um, when he was still in Congress and planning a run for the presidency, how they very strategically used photography to build his image that often involved bringing in the image of uh, his very equally young and beautiful wife, Jackie Kennedy. Um, they bought, uh, basically bought, the family bought a feature in Life magazine <laughs> um, in I think the late 50s of them on a sailboat. They're gorgeous, they're young, they're the future. I mean, you, you could just sort of see how they were working that all out. Um, what's also interesting about Kennedy, and I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to do this in the bigger project, is he also comes in an era where television is becoming um, uh, increasingly important. So you have the famous Nixon televised uh, debates between Nixon and Kennedy in 1960. And so the televisual image is um, definitely going to, it definitely influences the way that people think about photography in this period. And so that's one of the things I'm kind of still trying to think about because no medium ever exists in a vacuum. And so if I, you know, I'm like, probably I'm gonna write about early 20th century, I'm gonna have to talk about early film, and then I'm gonna have to talk about early television later. So I'll probably be writing this book forever. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Other question?
Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is essentially, in some ways you're kind of asking like, can we assume that he's genuine, as genuine as he might seem in the act of participating in this kind of selfie culture, or do we kind of feel like the president is like always having to be on in a different way? I mean, I think probably the answer is both. You know, I heard an interview with Pete Souza, who's the chief White House photographer. I mentioned him a couple times in my talk. And he basically, people were like, well, you're doing all the social media, and that's because Obama was so revolutionary and really used the internet in a new way to get elected and, and really was kind of on it before a lot of other candidates really understood what organizing was gonna be like uh, if you really mobilize people at the grassroots and online, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they were like, so that's why you're doing all the photography stuff. And Pete Souza sort of brushed that off in a way that I was kind of surprised by. He said, well, you know, all of that stuff came along and whoever was in office would have had to use it which is an interesting answer and it is something to think about. It seemed a little technologically deterministic to me because I don't necessarily think Obama has to you know, engage with people the way he is in that image. By the way, I gave a talk uh, where I talked a little bit about this image um, at the University of Iowa and someone raised her hand and said, I know that guy and he makes that face all the time. Like, <laughs> this was apparently, I, I, I can't quite remember, it was, it was a photo from, from Iowa at some point. And so that's the other thing about this kind of, the, the, of the social aspect of social media is you, we live in a world where you could totally know that guy and it wouldn't be weird at all, right, to see him in a picture with the president. Um, so, you know, I think it's both. I think Obama really understands the role of um, image and image making. I think he also really, um, maybe more than other presidents, gets the notion of the history of the presidency. So in some way, like if I could give him this talk sometime, you know, in his free time when he's no longer president, I'm sure he'll call me up and be like, hey, let's talk about this, right? Um, I'm sure, you know, the story I'm kind of telling here I think would be a story he would be interested in and would understand because I think he gets it, that idea that we have this history. You know, he, if he, every speech of Obama's that he ever gives, he always starts with a, a history lesson, even if it's just a sentence. He always wants to put things in context with the past and then show how they progressed to where we are now. So I think he gets it. Um, I think presidents have to care more about this. I'm gonna be really interested to see what happens with the next president, which we will have very soon, and how, the, how some of these technological developments in digital photography might play out there. I mean, you know, uh, would a President Clinton or a President Trump or a President Cruz or whoever, would that person kind of have to keep doing what Obama has done because he has now made it the thing that presidents must do? Or would they, choose uh, to go another way and what would be the effects of that. So it's a really interesting question. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah, so the question is, um, is Obama kind of leading or is he doing what we're all doing, which is making these adaptations to this way that media has, is now kind of lead, shaping our lives in these, all these really um, embedded ways. I think that's a part of it. You know, one of the things that I'm, when I'm thinking about this project, one of the things um, I'm, I'm interested in how presidents have used media, and I've always been interested in that, um, but I'm also interested in how media have used presidents. So, so my interest in this project really came from this idea of, you know, presidents have engaged with photography, they've made photographs. Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower was a big photographer. He loved to make photos, so, you know. So they weren't just kind of making them or being subjects of them, um, they were also making them and producing them as well as consuming them. And, you know, presidents have always been interested in this and it was just strange to me that no one had ever looked at that. So yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the things we could say is that Obama is, you know, he's going where the culture's going and he's adapting, and that's something that um, leaders, if they don't do, they need to at least recognize the consequences of not doing that, right? Um, and you could think of that in other contexts too, like policy contexts, right? Um, beliefs that, or political statements that people make that, you know, five years from now, they're not making anymore, right? Because the times have changed and they've had to kind of move with the times. 
Um, but yeah, I, it, it's an interesting question. And I definitely, what I don't want to say is that Obama is making us all take more selfies of each other. I definitely don't think that's true. But it is really interesting to think about kind of where he fits in, you know, what people in communication would call the media ecology. Like, where is he in that environment? Yeah, that's something I'm still puzzling over, for sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. And FDR is a great example because he really exploited the new medium of radio um, to do much the same thing, to uh, seem to be communicating directly to people, you know, into their ears, into their homes. That notion of calling it the fireside chat was really shrewd and smart because it made it seem like we're all here together, right, gathered around. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say because it's sort of like difficult to think about what the counterfactual would be. So like in a world where there, where there was television but no social media, how would Obama have been different? Um, it's, it's difficult to say because in some ways the world of social media also made Obama, you know, gave him the capacity to essentially become Obama, right? So he kind of rode the wave of all of these social and technological changes that were happening and exploited them really smartly in his campaigns. Um, but it is a good question, and radio is actually another example of, a, of, a, of another really dominant medium in the history of the presidency, like television, where um, it really did, uh, in, in a lot of ways, uh, change the ways that presidents could communicate. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that when you look at the other media, media like television or, or, um, or radio, they also remind us that just because a president uses one of those mediums doesn't mean that he or she is very good at them, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, Reagan was very, very good on television. Um, Carter was not very good on television, just if kind of objectively the way that they performed. Um, uh, same thing with radio. If you, if you kind of listen to the way FDR spoke, uh, very, uh, his short sentence structure, action verbs, you know, really kind of very clearly communicated to people versus the way that other people in the time spoke maybe less successfully. So um, Obama's really, really, really good at doing this kind of thing and they've clearly figured that out. And so to a certain extent, it gets back to the earlier question, it might play to his strengths in some ways, yeah. Okay, so time for one more. Yeah, let's bring this up. That's a really good question. So uh, for folks who might not have heard, the question is kind of, we live in a universe where at the same time we think of photographs as being, having their value being that they're very highly accurate and true. So for example, we have like right, mug shots that would allow you to have your identity or an ID card, or now we're talking about body cameras because they would record things that would supposedly reveal evidence or information you might not get otherwise. But then at the same time, we all at the same time have this knowledge that photographs are constructed, right? We make a selfie and we make 20 more and more until we get the one we like. So we're all very sophisticated. So it is, it is a conundrum and I think for me, what's really interesting about that is, is the conundrum itself. So, and then that's the, the question of which aspect of photography, the notion of it being constructed or the notion of it being um, you know, a faithful rendering or likeness, which aspect of photography 
comes to predominate at particular moments. So I mean, you could think of some of the examples of police videos, like dashboard camera videos that have been released. Um, there's a conversation that, uh, with, with valid, valid arguments on both sides that say, we need this because we need some kind of a record that will give us additional information than what we're able to get from witnesses at the scene or from what law enforcement might be reporting, et cetera. But at the same time, there's also a conversation about that same issue that's saying, well, these can be edited. <laughs> we don't know what happens to them when they get back to the police station. Who is in charge of them? We can make an image look anything we, like anything we want. I mean, I can do that on my phone, right? So it is this kind of constant push and pull. And for me, it's, it's that, that there's a really predominant, I think, faith in the, the, the value of having that so-called likeness image or that, um, you know, what people used to say, an authentic image. Um, and we always seem to go to that, and that becomes our kind of a default position, what, regardless of whether, you know, so if I'm arguing that an image is true or false, I have to believe that it should be true, otherwise I can't really make an argument about its falsity. So when you look at these arguments that are happening in contemporary contexts, um, you can kind of watch for that, that there's an, a, an underlying grounding that's saying, we feel like these photographs or these videos of these moments should be true and real. And we're worried that they might not be, um, or we want to try to figure out how to make them more true or real. So yeah, it's, it's really a tension at the fundamental, you know, that's really at the core of a lot of visual media, but I think photography especially. Thank you for the great questions.